All right. Welcome to the GovForward multi-cloud webinar series brought to you by Kerasoft and Government Executive Media Group. I'm Sam Jackson with Government Executive Media Group. Throughout this series, we're featuring more than 30 technology experts covering all facets of cloud and cloud security. These FedRAMP marketplace and multi-cloud technology thought leaders will highlight how their solutions enable agencies to address network security, data, and IT modernization challenges. You can see the full schedule of programs along with hundreds of related resources at kerasoft.com slash govforward. Please enjoy today's webcast, and without further ado, I'll give the floor to today's moderator, Nick Spies. Nick. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's program, The Changing Landscape of Data Collaboration, presented by Snowflake and Kerasoft. In today's program, we're going to talk about CDOs, the chief data officer of multiple agencies throughout the government, and their recent revolution in not just data management and data strategy, but also in data collaboration. We're going to do our best to be insightful and to be educational today, but I doubt we'll get to everything you want to know. So please, on the right hand side of your screen, feel free to take advantage of the question and answer platform. We'll get to those questions towards the end of our program today. Before we get started, we have to introduce our very important guest, Ms. Karen Reggie, the Chief Information Officer for the Directorate of the Defense Trade Controls at the Department of State. Karen, how are you today? I'm doing great. Thank you for asking, Nicholas. Good to be here. Oh, we're so happy to have you. Before we get started talking about data collaboration and, and uh, uh, our main topics today, I don't know too many folks who will have a great idea of what your directorate is all about. Can you give us an overview of what you folks are doing? Yeah, sure. I'd be happy to. So we are um, a regulatory agency within the Department of State. So our mission is to ensure that commercial exports of defense articles and defense services advance national security and foreign policy objectives. So this is sort of a very small and niche organization within the political military bureau. And, you know, the, the importance of the mission, you know, can't really be uh, overstated, and I'm I'm very happy and humbled to be to be a part of this organization that it isn't really well known, but is doing some really important work. I can tell you, there's a lot of agencies and offices in the government that aren't well known, but are doing very important work, and we're happy you're a part of yours. Um, Thank you. Going into our conversation space today, um, we're talking about data collaboration. We're talking about data sharing, and it occurs to me every time I talk about a topic like this. Um, I've been in, in the IT space for a long time, and we have this sort of round robin of words that we love to throw out, big data, analytics, cloud. Um, there used to be a joke bingo card I kept on my desk behind me of words that we overused and abused. And I feel like data sharing and collaboration in the, the landscape of IT right now, especially with everybody working from home and us focusing more on dashboards, I feel like we're getting to a point where we're we're in the danger zone of sharing and collaboration becoming a part of that. From the government side, do you folks see that same sort of paradigm or do you think it's more sincere than that? Well, gee, that's a great question. Uh, you know, we've we've always been in a position of having to data share. And it's one of our actually biggest pain points uh, because we're using uh, technology that's outdated. And, you know, there's a lot of governance that goes around those data sharing um, agreements between agencies. And honestly, sometimes I just think as much as I love the idea of sharing data, that sometimes it's just too hard from, from the agreements that you have to have at the highest levels of government to the technology. And I'm seeing that shift a little bit uh, because I think that no longer is the technology sort of the long, a long pole in the tent. Now it's sort of the governance around it. And we're even you know, finding ways to do that easier with these cloud platforms that have come up. So that's an interesting perspective. I want to hone in on that. So we talk about, and this is part of my, my uh, big image and talk track for this. We talk about data sharing and, and all this wonderful collaboration. And that's great on the operational side. But I'm an engineer, you're a CIO, right? We think about the ones and zeros. How do these things fit together? And in your in your directorate, trying to get the Department of State to talk to uh, the Department of Labor or uh, CIS or maybe some other stakeholders that you have in your industry, on the engineering side of that, that's where the collaboration has to start, right? It can't be just the data. How do we get the data there? Can you talk about that journey for us? Yeah, so I mean, for a long time, we have been collaborating with a number of interagency partners. We have, um, we, we do that with the Department of Defense, with DITSA, 
Uh, we do that with the Department of Commerce, with BIS. And then we also do a lot of sharing with um, Department of Homeland Security, CBP in particular, since they're sort of the enforcement end of the work that we do at the directorate. And so these, the sharing has been, um, you know, the process by which we share data is we, we decide to share data. And, and sometimes that comes um, out of necessity. And sometimes that comes out of, you know, sheer determination to do a better job of the mission. Um, and then there's all these agreements that have to come into play and all the security around it that needs to be known by both, a, you know, both agencies if it's a bilateral sharing agreement. And then, of course, there's the technology. And, you know, a lot of our sharing has been with SFTP servers and, you know, back and forth and, and, and sort of making sure that those things stay stable so that we can, you know, be part of, we also have a sharing agreement with, uh, with census um, in commerce. And so then there's all sorts of non-disclosure agreements that we've entered into in having some of this data. So there's, there's really a lot to it. Um, and, and I'm finding that people were so worried about sort of the technology and then the security and then all the agreements. And, you know, after five years of being in this role, I've sort of finally figured out how to do this in a way where it's not so daunting that we don't share anything, which which I think is is sort of where a lot of people come from is it's it's just hard to get all those pieces together. And, and it takes months sometimes, um, you know, and sometimes it even takes years um, for agencies to get hold of somebody else's data. Um, you know, so so that's really kind of the 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 interesting part of this is that you know it it sort of taxes every bit of of a government bureaucrat um, to actually get it done because it requires all this policy and governance and security and and ones and zeros as you said and engineering and and all of a sudden it comes together and then you can start doing a better job of the mission. Yeah, absolutely. It, so it's I, I I've. I've stolen shamelessly in the past from people way smarter than me that I think there are really three things that stop any interagency collaboration. And this applies not just to government agencies, but also to the folks that are doing this in the private sector and private citizens as well. Uh, three things that really come out of it. It's people, it's policy, and it's the pipes. And on the people side, you know, you have to decide you're going to share that data. You have to consciously decide you're going to do that. You have to consciously decide what the scope and the breadth of that is. And then you have to pick up the phone and call someone and say, hey, do you even want this stuff? Right. Um, that's, I think, been in the past, that's been our biggest hurdle is that we just loved our silos and we didn't want to build it. And it was never the policy side. I mean, there were always policies. Our default answer tended to be no, right? My data is my data and you just can't have it. <laughs> um, when it says that you can have it, I'm still going to say you can't have it because it's mine. And then on the pipe side, again, we build silos. And, and in those silos, we work the way our data is arranged. And when we build these silos on purpose, we tend to work in those silos. And so to me, uh, just echoing your comments earlier, it seems like people are the are the single biggest problem. But it's if we're looking for a silver lining, uh, the collaboration that we've seen in the COVID-19 pandemic, getting data from John Hopkins University, the World Health Organization, local governments, getting that data moved around and that collaboration to start, it almost seems like now the people are pounding on that door to get access to all of this data. And everybody who writes policy and builds pipelines are, are trying to catch up. Um, you know, in, in your case, do you see that same shift happening? This is you know, obviously a very medical kind of focused thing, but do you folks see that same sort of shift where now the people are pushing and the policy and pipes have to catch up? Well, you know, it's it's funny that you mentioned that because I hadn't really ever thought about it. But, you know, a lot of the conversations that I've been having recently, um, you know, have been during this pandemic. You know, maybe we're all sitting back, you know, in our house thinking about these things and deciding that it's now time to share and, <laughs> have to, you know, hurry up and execute. Um, but I hadn't actually thought about it. Um, you know, like I said, we've always shared, but we haven't always as a group um, thought about the ways in which we could do that most efficiently or with the greatest amount of security. It's like once you're sort of done with it, you just don't want to break it. And, and what I'm finding is that I've had conversations during the pandemic since I've been at home with all of my counterparts 
at the agencies with, with, with whom we share data. And this is unprecedented for me to have conversations in a single three or four month period with all of them separately. <laughs> um, some that I initiated and some that were initiated to me. But it, it certainly has been something where I've thought a lot about actually taking this time to actually get this work done so that we can be um, a, a more collaborative uh, government and do our mission more effectively. Outstanding. So I want to dig into those conversations. I think everybody on the webinar does. So when you folks are in there having these conversations, do you find yourself, uh, to kind of prove out my point, hopefully, do you find yourselves talking about policy and pipes, or are you talking about the opening part of the initiative? Because, correct me if I'm wrong, um, you folks are in the very beginning of this data collaboration journey. So you're trying to figure out and and you know build this stuff and architect this to be beneficial to every everybody that you work with. Is Where do those conversations focus, and what kind of problems are you trying to solve in there? Yeah, so it's interesting because, you know, we've been collaborating for a long time, but it's not something that we generally talk about because it's so much a part of our business. So when we adjudicate a license um, or, or authorize a registrant, we automatically send that information over to CBP, for example, because they're the ones that have to enforce the rules. They're the ones that can't let someone who's unregistered or who doesn't have a license be able to ship something out of the country. And so, but we've never had, what, what's different about right now is, is this, this work has always been done at, at sort of the staff level. And it's really been done in sort of a sneaker net way where we're just moving data files from here and there and everywhere to send over to some, you know, to some server somewhere that someone's then picking up um, and doing what they need to do with it. And we're having conversations around how to actually make that work more seamlessly and make sure, because what we're finding, what we found over the last 10 years of, of doing this data collaboration is that these things get out of sync. Um, and, and we end up with um, questions about, well, why is this license not over at CBP? Or why is this registration expired when it shows over in this other system that it's not expired? And so there's these one-off issues, these pain points that really matter because what people are trying to do is export, um, you know, authorized defense articles and services, um, and, and they're not able to because they'll get a fatal error from, from CBP. And what we want to try to do is make sure that there's really one source of truth and that it is a single source so that when a license is adjudicated or when a registration is authorized, that CBP automatically gets that data so that they're so so we're we're not having any sort of delay and with this manual process that we've been doing for so long you know some some records just don't end up moving over and it's not until the, there's real pain by the industry that all of a sudden they can't ship and then we then we find out about it and then we we immediately take care of it but those kinds of things in 2020 really shouldn't happen and that's why it's so important to us to get this data collaboration and and get it uh, perfect um, and automated, because this is the stuff that machines do better than human beings um, in terms of you know picking up data files and moving them over somewhere. Absolutely, I couldn't agree more. And, and it kind of builds into this. You know, we um, Snowflake in particular, we use this this single source of truth nomenclature. We say that a lot. And but really, it, it gets bigger than that because the single source of truth for most agencies is what their data, their data tells them, right? It's my single source of truth. But you right. could have your own source of truth that could contradict mine. And if you're sharing data in a non-synchronized way, there is no central sort of truth, which is why I think a lot of folks are. And I've, you know, I spent ten years in the Department of Defense. I watched uh, data sets get aggregated, get built out, get duplicated, get replicated. Uh, and I didn't have a single source of truth. I had 23 of them and uh, <laughs> nobody else could get access to them. And so you ended up in a, in a position where um, a single source of truth was never a global single source of truth. It wasn't truth. It was my truth, which may not be somebody else. Uh, namaste. Uh, so I think, you know, for for a lot of folks on the call, um, when we build out these giant uh, enterprises with this data sharing, with data collaboration, and we talk about a single source of truth. I think a core tenant to talk about is how can we all share the same basic subset of data, but this is going to end up getting into, into governance here in a second, but how do we have that single source of truth across all of our agencies, 
but maintain that security and that governance. And it could come from things. Um, I've seen some questions in the Q&A window on on having particular schemas or, you know, how do we share things in a in a in a in the right way? So you can see a curated subset of my data, but you can't see everything that's my data. Um, so to talk a little bit about that, when you're having these conversations and you're planning these things out, are you folks thinking about the data bloat problem? Are you thinking about the governance problems or what's the what's the general consensus on the approach there? Yeah, I mean, this is a great question. And I think everybody has sort of um, different ideas about what the most important pieces of this thing are. Um, you know, because our use cases are such that we share huge amounts of data with both um, Department of Defense and uh, with with uh, our friends over at Commerce and as well as CBP. I mean, I think I think from my perspective, I am most interested in making sure that the data is synchronized and that it's that that they have the data that they need to do their part in the process. And that that applies to DOD when they look at the licenses to adjudicate them and our and our colleagues at, at, at Commerce. And with CBP, it's to ensure that as soon as the directorate has made a decision about an adjudicated license, that someone can actually ship on it so that there's no delay, you know, in the supply chain. Um, because of, you know, a data synchronization problem. But I do know that I'm also, you know, I've, I've often talked about this within, within the agency, that my big concern is the security of the data, because the way that we're doing things now, moving things from sensitive but unclassified network to a classified network and so on and so forth, and all the manual pieces that come around that is just it's just something that that's the one thing that keeps me up at night is that, you know, these are things that should be done uh, with with systems and on platforms and, and should be happening automatically as opposed to, um, you know, individual people moving files. And, and of course, those people that are doing it um, are doing it with the best intent and doing in, in general a great job. But it doesn't stop the fact that there's a security risk in doing it in that way. Um, and then other people have different ideas about about you know about what is important. I think it really depends a lot on what the use case is and what people are using the data for. Um, and I know with CVP, I mean the thing that I recognize uh, from the get go is that you know they share data with, I think it's forty seven different agencies, you know, and we're we're among them. We're one of forty seven agencies that they're sharing data with, and so <laughs> you know, from my perspective, it's like, look, I'm I'm just a, I'm a cog in the wheel, right? And and we need to make sure that this works, but that it works in general, it works for everyone, and that CBP doesn't have to build multiple things to share with multiple agencies, and and that's an it's a really exciting thing um, for me to be part of of what CBP is doing, but I do recognize that, you know, whatever they want to do is sort of what I want to do uh, because they, they, they have to, it has to be something that's going to work overall. And I think it goes to what you're talking about, about, you know, having this massive collaboration um, on, in the export and import communities. Um, and, and I think it's so exciting to be part of that. That's outstanding. So I've, um, sometimes successfully, most times unsuccessfully argued with uh, some of my my other collaborators that the world of IT is going over from being a place where we would design systems and tools to a place where we design and build to interfaces. And in the coding world, for those of us on the call who are our, uh, our keyboard guys writing code like Python or Java, we're used to bringing in new libraries of code and those kinds of things. But on the system front, this is relatively new. There's great APIs out there now from, from Google and Amazon and Microsoft and uh, a, a huge variety of partners. There's data protection and governance and cataloging tools out there that are coming in to help us manage this giant maelstrom of data. Can you talk about when you're building processes and architecting these systems, and more importantly, when you're talking about building them to collaborate, is it an interface-based conversation or is it still based in tools and the interfaces come later? Well, that's a great question. I hadn't actually really thought about it that way, but you know, I, um, you know, I come at this um, thinking about you know interfaces and and you know and how and how that's actually going to work to make sure that the process works better. You know, because really at the end of the day, what we're looking for is this is all part of a larger process. I mean, our industry starts by submitting all this data to us. We then share it out with an interagency, right? So that they can actually adjudicate it. So it's it's these decisions get co-made by 
the director of defense trade control the department of state but it, dod um is involved in making the decisions as is commerce so we're sort of in the middle and we're the ones that finally arbitrate it and and authorize it but there's a lot of people involved and so there's that data sharing and then there's the data sharing back to the industry to say okay you have adjudicated license we want to give you an api so that you can automatically sweep that back into your system to make it more efficient in terms of being able to then provide the data to the person who's actually going to do the filing with cbp and get it out of the country so there's just this this whole landscape of of data moving around to actually facilitate this trade um, and and the supply chain and you know so I really do think about it in terms of of these interfaces um, and and actually having everything seamlessly work together so that it can be quick and so that we can shave off time uh, with respect to these authorizations which are so important to the um, to the industrial base. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So we've got a bunch of questions about some open architecture standards. Uh, I've seen some great questions come in, folks. We are going to uh, keep getting to those. Please, please, please keep submitting your questions to us as part of the Q&A. Um, I know we're talking, uh, somebody has a, a great question here. Reference edge to cloud computing strategies. Uh, consider some of the edge sensors for real-time data to multiple collaborative interests. So I wanted to bring it up now because uh, I know when we talk about governance, we talk about workflows, we talk about where the data comes from and where it goes to, we can't not talk about those edge users or those bandwidth restricted users. So I would, I think, you know, talking about shipping containers and some of the, the uh, uh, IoT sensors that might be involved in some of that stuff, are you folks able to, anything with IoT sensors today, is that an area where you're gonna focus on in the future? And have you thought about the architecture required to support something like that, like an edge computing case? Yeah, I mean, honestly, we're we're sort of right at the beginning of this journey, Nick. And you know, we're um, we're having these collaborative conversations. We're having um, conversations internally, and um, you know, I, I would say that we're not there yet. Yeah, outstanding. Okay. So I want to kind of go back into uh, some of the use case development, some of the conversations you're having. I mean, obviously, you folks have run through some use cases where data collaboration directly is, is something that you're interested in doing. Do you have a couple of direct, uh, you've mentioned the shipping containers and, and some of the trade control shipping information you do now. Is there a really direct use case where you can talk through a little bit about how that would work in, in whole that you could share with us? Well, I mean, you know, we, we just we have a lot of different use cases. And um, are you I mean, we have the industry that shares all this data with us and, and they do that, of course, through our applications. But I think that the more um, the more, you know, in, in line with what we're talking about here with with government collaboration, you know, I think that um, our 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 data moving our data um, to the the Department of Defense is a really important piece, but that's necessitated by the fact that all of these adjudicated licenses actually get processed in a classified system. And so, and so now, um, you know, so you can imagine what that looks like, right? Because we're actually moving network, you know, we're moving data across networks. Um, and, and so, so we have the use case of of having uh, you know a guard and and doing that and trying to do that in an automated way, so that's something that we're sort of looking at um, and and trying to work with our counterparts um, in the main IT area of the Department of State. And then we have this very large use case, multiple times a day transfer of data over to CBP um, at DHS, and that is a really important part of our process. Um, where we're providing all the adjudicated licenses and all of the registrants to CVP so that when people come in to try to do shipments, um, they're able to do that seamlessly. Okay, so they don't have to come back to us. We don't have any part of that. CVP sort of takes over um, and, and makes sure that the people are the right people, that it's going to the right place, and that the commodities are what was authorized to go over there. And so the idea of, and, and we literally are transferring all of the updates, um, you know, once or twice a day. I mean, during COVID, we were doing it once a day. Before that, we used to do it twice a day. Um, and now we're, we're at a place where, since everything is in the cloud, 
you know, we want to automate this so that it can happen in real time. You know, so people aren't waiting until some magic hour of three o'clock to to make sure that they don't, you know, put their shipment in, you know, and, <laughs> and, and further, I mean, it could be that, like I said before, that it got missed or something, right? Because a lot of this, um, we just poured it over a really, um, you know, a, a really old fashioned way of doing things where it was record by record, you know, and, and now what we're talking about is making sure that we can, we can really effectively provide this data and do it very quickly um, so that so that these things can ship and go along their way um, out of the country and so on. So, so you know, this is really the, the most important use case um, in my mind, the lowest hanging fruit of us being able to do it in a modern way and do it in, in real time um, and, and do it from, you know, from cloud environments, you know, because all of our systems are now um, in Microsoft Azure government. And, and so we're not relying on having to, uh, you know, to be in this private network. I mean, we had an air gap network before where no one had access to anything. Like we were just pulling data out of it and then pushing data over, you know, over the internet from a separate network. So just in the last three or four months, um, we're now in a position where we don't have to physically move data from one network to another. That, that warms the cockles of my engineering heart. Um, <laughs> can you talk about what, uh, you know, obviously when people start talking about automation, especially in data pipelines, we look for standardization of data objects. So JSON, XML, Avro, Parquet, all these data formats that are out there. And the trend 10 years ago or so was to create your own flavor of XML. That then evolved into, we have JSON objects, are you finding that the, the ability to interchange between the agencies you're working with, are they necessitating the creation of a data standard um, and a set object schema? Or are you sort of doing a little bit more creativity in your pipelines? Yeah, I mean, we're working together to try to figure out what the best the best thing to do is. Um, you know, and, and like I said, CBP has the most, um, you know, partners in terms of data collaboration, and they have you know, their idea of it. And we, we're using JSON, um, you know, in certain instances, and we're using um, XML um, in other instances. And CBP has has a data set, um, you know, that, that has been, um, you know, worked through, uh, you know, I don't even know what it is, um, but but we use their standard um, and, and transmuted our data into their standard, um, which is how we, we interchange with them. And that that was important, of course, because they have so many. You know, they wouldn't want to have forty seven, you know, forty seven different ways of looking at the same data, right? They need to have that kind of structure. And so, I would say that they're probably the most, um, you know, they've done the most work around this of the agencies that we share with. Outstanding. Yeah, I um, uh, uh, six months ago, I was not aware about part of how uh, genomics data was shared and collaborated on. And so I, I spent some time doing a bunch of research on that. We've got some of that going on in Snowflake where um, you know, one of our, our most exciting use cases our customers are, are adopting is bringing in genomics data from multiple different places and bringing that into one place to do research and pattern analysis for things like better medical treatments and, and faster hospital recovery times um, even before the, the, the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, we saw a lot of this with malaria. We saw a lot of this with uh, uh, with research on Lou Gehrig's disease. Uh, and so there's been a lot of great progress there. But what's interesting is folks are more interested now in, uh, you know, we can go back years ago and say Kubernetes was how apps move between clouds to give really that portability to applications. But how do we do that with data? And that's what we've been trying to figure out, I think, for forever now is how do I take my database and give somebody else access to that? So the cloud has been instrumental in that. Been very excited to see all the, the recent developments there with cloud coming in for data collaboration and sharing. Could you have done this? And this is a rhetorical question for the sake of everybody at home. Could we have done this without cloud? And how could we have done it without cloud? And the answer is we have done it without cloud, but through FTP. And I think yes. Karen's done a great job of kind of bringing us down that path and saying, yes, we're still doing FTP today, but we have plans to do things a little bit differently. The bigger question there then we both, and to read, uh, thank you for your question, sir, just came up with, how do we start using uh, authority-based access controls and role-based access controls? Now that cloud is bringing all the data together, how do we separate that kind of access? 
How are those conversations going on your end, Karen? Well, that's uh, that's interesting because you know um, with the with the cloud, I mean, this becomes even more important if you have you know your own little private network, you know, and only the people that have access and that sort of thing. So, you know, I mean, I think that I mean, in in general, what we have used um, for all of our internal and external users, we're using um, Okta, um, you know. To, to do all of our roles-based um, access control as well as our authentication. And we have a really big authentication piece because we do want to make sure that our external users are who they say they are when they make applications and are who say, and, and only get access to their own data, right? Because there's a lot of proprietary data, there's technical data, there's a lot of really important data um, in our set. So um, in terms of all of that, you know, we have found that Okta has been a great partner um, and we've implemented it, um, you know, just across the board with cloud native applications that we've built um, in Azure, as well as, you know, some other things that we have in ServiceNow. And then, of course, we also have, um, we use Box, and so we have the access to that, um, Tableau as well. So, you know, we basically have integrated all of these different pieces and then have used Okta as, as sort of our um, authentication mechanism for, and it, this has primarily been, it's not so much the people that we have internally working on it. There's just a couple of hundred uh, people that actually work in the directorate um, doing these activities, but there's about 15,000 different organizations and, you know, 50 or 60,000 users um, that actually take part in some aspect of, of their, you know, their compliance and regulatory um, pieces that they have to accomplish with us as the directorate. Yeah, and so and I've kind of been dancing around it because it's a, it's a very long conversation, but we talk about the governance, we talk about the data protection stuff. And so I want to kind of circle back on this. We've had questions about, you know, authority-based access, about role-based access control, about what kind of schemas do we use to share this data? And first, I want to talk about um, what cloud has sort of done to the cybersecurity world in, in general. Um, it's not as easy as protecting endpoints anymore. In fact, we could argue that people are attacked far more than any laptop or operating system these days. But in the cloud, things get a little bit more complicated because it's mostly an API glued together network. Um, we have to say that it's zero trust. It's not my network. It's somebody right. else's. And so in the world of big data, what, what, we've, what we've seen, I think the industry moving towards adopting is instead of just having little parts of our data or a SIM tool with access to the last 30 days or 90 days or six months, that giant everything anybody has ever done ever on the system has to be saved, cross-referenced, preserved, and really looked at, not just to decide, um, you know, have we been, have we been attacked? Uh, are we vulnerable? But also to decide, has something happened six months ago? Did something happen to a mission partner of mine? Data collaboration has never been logs. It's never been security events. But I think we're also moving there to a large degree as well because persistent attackers don't just go after, for example, trade controls. They may also go after CBP or CIS. Um, they may go after labor department, whatever that angle is. And the more we entwine our systems, the more we also need to entwine our defenses. So I've, I've seen a lot of movements uh, and we've had probably four or five questions on the governance side. Um, today, we're doing this the way that we've been doing this for a while. Great authentication systems, K uh, Karen mentioned Okta. So I think that's obviously going to continue. They've got a phenomenal platform. Uh, great uh, uh, encryption technologies, uh, all the, the, uh, the cloud HSMs that are installed in each of those regions help with data at rest and in flight uh, protection and encryption. We have to keep leveraging those. But in the future, we're going to see much more uh, collaboration, I think, also on the cybersecurity side to identify persistent threat actors uh, uh, and, and protect our systems in a more holistic manner across agency. Karen, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that, if you want to agree. You've been nodding, and I appreciate that. <laughs> no, I totally, I, I you know, it, we haven't, you know, we really haven't, um, you know, done as much on that as I would say that we need to in the future. Um, and in terms of sharing that kind of data and and that sort of thing is going to be really important as well, because, you know, what one person finds out, um, you know, can be enormously useful to someone else um, as it relates to these matters. And since, you know, we're all sort of connected in all these different ways, I mean, we, we are, 
we are good at figuring out what other people are doing, but sort of trust that if they have an authorization to operate, then they're secure, right? And just because you have an authorization to operate does not mean that someone, you know, that, that you're not going to have trouble, right? I mean, it's this continuous monitoring, and it's then that sharing of that continuous monitoring that is the ultimate stage, right? Because then we can all do a better job of the mission. And at the end of the day, um, you know, this is the important, this is the most important day-to-day -day activity that we have. Once we have all these this data sharing happening without all this, with all, all without a whole bunch of people having to do it, um, we we do need to make sure that we 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 keep the data secure, right? And especially when it's the kind of data that we're talking about in this conversation. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. In fact, I we in the industry, we tend to talk a lot about artificial intelligence and machine learning and how it's gonna revolutionize our world more than any technology in the last 30 years. But honestly, I think the, the greatest, I'll call it midterm, not short-term payoff that we'll get from artificial intelligence and machine learning is really in cyber security and defense. Yes. Absolutely. I think, the, especially as as we just mentioned, all of the different interconnected systems working together. Um, you know, one of the biggest fears we get is, oh, it's going to, but AI is going to replace human beings. It's not. It's just the vast amount of data that we're going to be gathering into these systems to start doing this pattern detection. We need something that's that's got that huge consciousness to look across all of that data, find those patterns, and then alert our cybersecurity specialists that something really weird is going on. Um, and I think that's really where AI and ML is going to play the biggest short term gain. Is that a place, you know, are you guys talking about AI and ML in your collaboration efforts today, Karen? And is cybersecurity come up in that conversation? Yeah, you know, we haven't really talked as much about that as I think we will once we make this, you know, once, I mean, I think that will be, you know, set, secondary, but close secondary to actually sharing the data in a more modern way is making sure that we are sharing those kinds of that kind of data as well, because it's going to be like you said, I mean, I don't see anybody losing their I don't see anybody losing their job. We, what we're going to be doing and it, it's not just it's it's cybersecurity where we're actually looking at all this stuff and sharing that information and having the humans do what what they do best and the machines do what they do best. Right. And then the, the other thing is um, is in terms of being able to just sort sort of share across the ecosystem all the things that you've learned in terms of cybersecurity and alerts that you're seeing, because it's very, it's it's obvious that that these things would be happening in different agencies, right? I mean, when I was at the Federal Communications Commission, I remember thinking to myself, well, why on earth would anybody want to um, want to do anything to the FCC? Because all of our stuff was public. We made everything public because there wasn't really. Um, very much that that needed to not be public in terms of our licensing and so forth. But, you know, it wasn't until much later that I realized that, you know, for someone to play in that area where they thought, well, that won't be that hard, you know, to intrude. And then they learn something, you know, so it's like, the you know, maybe it's the nursery school or the kindergarten you know, <laughs> before you get to the eighth grade or something like that, you know. So it never really occurred to me. And even though, you know, I was at a CIO level there and it just – didn't occur to me that we would be the target. Um, and that was just so wrong in, in terms of my thinking, because of course you're going to be the target because, you know, it's something where, you know, maybe it would be easier because you're not that focused because you don't have that much um, data, but it, but it helps people to learn things about how these networks are set up and how these systems are set up. So, um, you know, when I came to state department, I was like my biggest thing, um, you know, in the first few months that I was there, was, you know, this is all I need to care about, not all I need to care about, but I really need to spend a lot of my energy worrying about security here. Um, like Absolutely. never before, right? <laughs> because, <you> know, <laughs> at, at the FCC, I was doing these high stakes auctions, you know, and, and we needed, we had different use cases there, right? We had to have precision in terms of the algorithms that were coming up with the next prices and make sure that the winners were really the winners and so on and so forth. And over here in this movement toward, um, you know, the directorate, it's it's all about, OK, it's a very simple workflow in a lot of ways to get an adjudicated license out. But all the way across the board, you got to worry about the data and you got to worry about the security of the data and, and making sure that you don't end up in a position where um, where anybody that shouldn't have seen the data is looking at the data. 
Um, and so I, I really see that as part of this collaboration effort that we should be doing more talking about how not just, OK, you've got an authorization to, uh, to operate, so you must be secure. But like, oh, how are we actually going to make sure that this stuff is secure across our individual network and across you know, these APIs and all these different ways in which we're sharing it? Absolutely. And as we talk, so we're talking about cybersecurity data, we're talking about governance, we're talking about all this data collaboration. We've talked about a lot of data. How do we, and are you concerned with, I should say, data bloat? Are you concerned with the amount and the volumes of data that you're going to get? Are we going to be keeping this stuff for 30 years or forever? Is it going to be valuable? Is it going to be a scary volume of data? Have you folks talked about retention policies, about how much data you really want to keep on hand and how you're going to use it? I have my own opinions. I'll give mine after I'm done, after you're done. <laughs> okay, well, that's great. Because, you know, I haven't argued at all about the retention policies. We have very long retention policies, um, you know, for our data. Um, I think the minimum is 25 years. Um, and so, you know, when we rebuilt the system, you know, DEX, which is the new modernized system, I said, you know, I'm not taking all that old data. Like, I, I'll take it and I'll put it somewhere and I'll give you access to it, but it's not coming into the new system. Why? Because the data quality wasn't there to get it to easily bring into the new system, right? And so I don't mind retention, but, you know, a lot of people have really different um, ideas than I do about, like, a lot of the business users are like, you need to put it all, you need to have it all, all the last 25 years, you need to have it all in one place. And, uh, and it needs to be in the production system. And I sort of say, well, you know, my own view is we need to have um, the active, um, you know, we, we need to look at the last five to seven years and have that five to, five to 10 years, you know, depending on what it is, we need to have that data at the ready and the older historical data, we need to have access to it. Um, and we need to be able to quickly get to it with, with um, dashboards or with, you know, search capability and that sort of thing. But it's not where you're actually going to do all the, all the work, right? You're, you've got to do the Freedom of Information Act requests. You've got to have congressional um, access. Sometimes you need law enforcement access from time to time. All of those really important use cases, but not necessarily the ones that you want to actually have in your production uh, operational system that you're, where you're actually trying to move things um, down the road. I would agree. And I, I think my answer to that question has always been the use case has to be online. Mm -hmm. What's the use case? Yes. yes. If, if I've got a four day decision period, I need four days of data. If I've got, for example, I'll go back to cybersecurity for a minute. A cybersecurity infiltration is not typically in a, in a large persistent threat like this. It's not three days. It's three months, three yeah. quarters, three years. And so that data the data that it takes to notice the trend, the data that it takes to, to know my agency's mission or my business best, that's the length of the data that has to, to, has to be kept. And I don't think, you know, it, it's easy for us to sit here on a, on a web, webinar and tell folks that, hey, storage in the cloud is cheap. What are you worried about? But I think the bigger concern there is the data cataloging work that's required for when those data sets get so big. And actually, we had a really great question come across the Q&A, folks. Please keep those coming that I wanted to kind of follow into was when you talk about the collaboration, you're having those conversations with some of your other stakeholders, is are you concerned with having a global data catalog that incorporates what they want your data to look like? Because I mean, I, I, I would think you're gonna wanna have live access to your data from them and live access to their data for you. In that case, does that data catalog become part of the conversation and who runs that? How do you get through that? What's your thoughts there on the cataloging side? Yeah, no, I think it's really important to have a data catalog um, just so that, I mean, because one of the things that people, why people I think are uncomfortable with, um, with sharing data is that the data is gonna be somehow misunderstood, right? And so, um, you know, or misinterpreted or reported in a way that doesn't make sense or, you know, all of these other things. So, I, I mean, I really do think that the data catalog is, is so important to really help both agencies understand actually what does this data mean and, and, and where, what pieces of it should you be caring about, right? And that's the only way that we can actually uh, make sure that when we share the data that it gets used properly, um, you know, so so I think in terms of, you know, who maintains it and how it's maintained and all of those other things, I mean, that's all conversation that needs to happen. And, 
you know, um, you know, for example, with with the case with CBP, I mean, we basically, you know, have as part of our agreement, this is the data that we're sharing and this is what it means. But I think we need to do a better job as things, right, because that's a point in time. I mean, what do we do when things change? What do we do when when we make, you know, some sort of adjustment in that? Um, and, and how do we keep that catalog um, up to date? And CBP does a really good job of having these documents online, but in you know, without without question, what ends up happening is, you know, we forget to tell them or they forget to update it if we've told them. And then there's confusion because that's what new people are relying on when they're looking at this data um, and when they're looking at the um, at the documentation for the data. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, 100 percent. So I want to take some time and answer directly some of the questions that we have in our Q&A panel. Uh, folks, everybody who has contributed a question, I do appreciate it. I've pulled from those as we've talked, so hopefully I've covered quite a few along the way. But I did love this question. Leaders who don't understand implementation of policy can be the largest challenge. Most leaders do understand mapping, modeling, coding, and implementation of a plan or the resources that are required. I'm going to kind of turn that into a question about how has leadership built the policies that dictate some of this? And I apologize if that didn't 100% meet your original intent. But I want to talk about it because I didn't mention the president's management agenda. I haven't mentioned the Open Government Data Act, but I do want to mention it now because it goes directly to that exact question. I think we've seen a massive change in policy over the last even 18 months to 36 months in the government IT industry. Folks are looking to collaborate more. They now have a uh, congressional mandate to share that data with the public and with private industry. Um, so I, I think... Yes, in the past, we may have had folks who weren't into the collaboration, who didn't want to do the data sharing piece. But as we talked about earlier, the people, I think, now are starting to ask more for these technologies to demand more of this collaboration and data sharing because they recognize the value that it has to their agency. I don't know if you have any thoughts, Karen, you'd like to share as well. Yeah, well, I mean, we have a very recent um, collaboration with uh, with commerce, uh, and it's interesting that we never shared this information before. But you know, we have um, we have begun very recently. Just when we moved um, as the last and final phase of export control reform, um, we we moved guns over to commerce, and and as part of that, we started sharing some of our data to help them do a, do a better job of the mission. Um, and this was something. That um, that was really really important and and has been and and you know we, we there are there is so much it's not overlap but there there's so much area where you know the where where we have um, regulatory control and, and where BIS has it that having that shared data set um, to make sure that we're not selling or we're not having someone in the ecosystem or someone in the supply chain who's a bad actor. You know, sharing that information is really important, and it wasn't um, until fairly recently that we started sharing that information. And it was something that I was really surprised that we weren't sharing um, a long time ago. Um, and and while we probably have a lot of the same information, I mean, I I would suspect that ninety nine percent of our of our records are the, are exactly the same as what Commerce has. But you know, sometimes it's that one percent that really matters, right? And, oh, and that's, absolutely. You know, and so, um, you know, there's just been, I think, a, a, you know, a bigger emphasis on figuring out um, even in the last even in the last five years um, since I've been at, at, at state. You know, I have noticed, you know, our um, chief data officer, you know, getting more and more um, bureaus involved in figuring out all the ways in which we can share even within our own uh, department. Because you can imagine we have quite a lot of data and just sharing within the department um, has has been challenging and, and is now a question that everybody asks themselves, like, how can we share this data? And in the political military bureau, you know, we have one organization um, that basically does the dashboarding for all of the political military bureaus so that they can take all the different pieces, whether it's our commercial sales that that we are doing and the foreign military sales that that our counterpart RSAT is doing so that we can actually see a bigger picture of what's going on in all these different countries. And that 
That has all been in the last few years because of the cloud and because of the accessibility of the data and because of what, what people are recognizing, I think, with the president's management agenda is how important it is to be able to see a larger picture of what's going on um, in whatever ecosystem you're in, whether it's healthcare or or power or, you know, communications or, you know, armament, right? It doesn't matter. It's, it's you got to see the, the broadest picture that you can possibly see. And that's what the data allows for now. Absolutely. And I'm, I'm going to expand on that question a little bit because I, I think we all tend to focus on leadership as driving these kinds of initiatives, but it, we have to admit the success or failure of these things doesn't really fall on leadership. Yeah, we might build or buy the wrong thing. And those are all right. That's requirements gathering. There's a whole separate webinar for that. We'll do that in a couple of years when we all have time. But I want to talk about culture, right? The individuals in the agency, you mentioned dashboards. If you build dashboards that are awesome, but nobody use them, uses them, they're completely non-beneficial to the organization. And so maybe just as important or, or perhaps more important than having a leader who wants to instill that data sharing and collaboration is having the right people and the right culture inside the organization to adopt those practices too. Uh, I can tell you, I've been guilty of that in the past in, in prior roles in my life where uh, you know we built this new dashboard that was really handy and gave you all the information and I never clicked on it. Right, because we I didn't understand the value of it. I wasn't communicated to me, I wasn't bought into it. And so I abandoned that as an initiative. And I think that's all too common. I think it's gotten better uh, because we're all working remote now and understanding our, our own world is kind of through dashboards these days, as as um unfortunate as sometimes that is. But I think that's also part of it. It's it's now realizing that having not just a leader who wants to build a culture but having everybody buy into that culture is equally important, perhaps even more so. Yeah, I mean, I, I can't tell you, um, you know, how much this has shifted since the pandemic. I mean, we had users that didn't really want to, um, you know, get into doing, um, you know, their work on these new platforms. And now they're so thankful that they're actually able to do work from home. I mean, they, they are... They are absolutely um, astonished at the fact that they can actually do their work from home uh, because we we deployed um, the final parts of our system on February 18th, you know, and, and people were really, you know, sort of not even wanting to, like, turn their computer on and do the work in this new way. And then all of a sudden the pandemic and I said, OK, well, now you can do it from home. And some of the people were like, I can do what? Like, you know, this is a whole different, this is a whole different animal now, right? And and I love what you were talking about with regard to people using these dashboards, because that's that's the part, like the pretty picture. If people aren't using it, if people don't understand it, if you don't have a culture where people are going to use these kinds of tools, then it's sort of it's it's irrelevant, right? Completely irrelevant. Um, and and what I'm finding is that, you know, I was so excited because um, one of our areas, our policy area, you know, basically said we want to we want to subscribe um, to a service that provides artificial intelligence and machine learning around mergers and acquisitions. Um, and I was saying to myself, like a few years ago, like this wouldn't even be uh, this would never like escape their lips about how they want to be subscribers to these to these new types of tools and recognizing that. I mean, from a from a end user perspective, recognizing that the platforms and the subscriptions and all this stuff that the commercial sector is doing is what we actually need to be doing, not building our own little stovepipes. Right. But using what's already there and 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 using it. Um, in a way that um, that furthers the mission. So I was I was so excited about um, their not not only willingness, but you know they're pushing that envelope. Um, you know, as a user wanting to use these types of tools. Absolutely. So uh, I think we have time for one more question, and it's uh, it's one that I'm picking. It's a, it's right down my lane, Karen. So I'm going I'm going down it. Any insights on dealing with data bloat or object management in large production systems? Um, I'm going to contextualize this a bit bigger as well and talk about, you know, we've spoken about what your concern with and where that data needs to lie and how much data we should have. But really, there's an architectural choice to make as well. Um, I think the days of SFTP and FTP servers and moving data around, obviously, it's it's here for a while yet. But the cloud is taking that and making it a lot easier to do data collaboration and data sharing. 
Um, shameless plug. This is one of the core capabilities of my product, Snowflake, that we do very, very well, and we're very proud of that capability. It prevents bloat by allowing folks to share data in real time, access to the same data, and have that single source of global truth. I mentioned that was something I was going to plug, and I did. Um, this is really the answer, though. But it, it, you know, there are a ton of cloud technologies. S it, object storage was probably the first and most important technology that really was born in cloud that gave us the capability of sharing data at scale without contention, without falling down flat. Um, so I think to this question, how do you deal with the data bloat? Don't replicate data. Don't yeah. make copies and send it out everywhere. Find right. ways to give folks governed, secure access to a single place where that data lives. I think that's how we deal with that. Um, and Karen, you and I have had a wonderful conversation about that as well. <laughs> yeah, so no, I, 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 I totally agree with you. Um, you know, that, that's what needs to happen. That's how we need to share this data. Um, and that's really the only way forward. And the, the beauty is that there are, uh, you know, there are tools that will actually do this for you, you know. And so I'm always, as a government, as a government person, I'm always looking for the thing that can integrate quickly and efficiently um, and that can be secure and that um, can can take on these pain points, um, which are many in this in this data collaboration world. And so, um, you know, I'm I'm very excited with the new technologies that's out there and and being able to use these tools in a way that's going to really further our mission and make uh, make things a lot easier and 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 a lot uh, less error prone um, as we move forward. Outstanding. Well, folks, I think we are about out of time for today. I can't thank Karen enough for joining me, the uh, CIO for the Directorate of uh, Defense Trade Controls at the Department of State. Thank you so much for coming out with us today. If you'd like some more information on what we've gone through on today's webinar, you can reach out to me here at the email address specified. This uh, webinar was recorded and will be made available to you by the end of the week. We hope you all stay safe and healthy. Thank you very much and have a great week. Thank you all. Thank you, Nick. I really appreciate it. It was fun. Had a blast.